Welcome to CivilNet. Joining me via Skype from Worcester, Massachusetts is historian Umit Kurt of Clark University. Umit, thank you for joining us once again. Thanks a lot for having me. Uh, you are a recurring guest here uh, on our show. Uh, this year, now we are in the 100th year of the centennial of the Armenian Genocide of 1915. We have been having conversations with Armenians and Turks uh, Armenians from Armenia, from the diaspora, and Turks from all over the world, including Turkey. Um, you are an expert uh, in Ottoman Empire history. You recently gave an interview to the Armenian Turkish weekly Agos newspaper in Istanbul uh, about the Armenians of Aintep. Uh, you know, we have all heard stories from our grandparents, you know, reaching back to different cities that are now in, in Turkey. Uh, talk to me, if you will, about what took place. I mean, when did the deportation start at Nintab? What happened with the property of the Armenians there? Uh, and, and really, if you could sort of give us the global sort of story of the people of Nintab, and then we'll get into the details. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Agos and Emrejan Dalolo from Agos who uh, made the interview with me and who asked uh, also uh, excellent questions regarding my uh, research in Nintab. Ayintab, as you know, is uh, situated southeastern part of Turkey, and uh, and uh, a good number of uh, Armenians and well-established Armenian population, uh, both Orthodox, I mean Gregorian, Protestant, and the Catholic Armenians, used to live in Ayintab. And the uh, deportation in Ayintab actually took place uh, in quite late, vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, especially eastern uh, cities, the six vilayets of Anatolia and the uh, other cities in, in, the, in the whole Anatolia. Because Ainta was not in the deportation uh, scheme, deportation plan of the Union and Progress Party at the very beginning, in the first place, until late July. So the deportation in Ainta uh, started off in, uh, in, in, in the first day of August, the first convoy, uh, which, compo which composed of uh, approximately 50 uh, families of Gregorian Armenians uh, were determined, their names, the list of their names was determined in a secret meeting uh, which took place among the members of Union and Progress Party in Ayintap itself and the other local and provincial elites who decided and who also convinced the Union and Progress Party lead the politicians in Istanbul to deport Aintap Armenians. But uh, so, you know, a logical question that comes to mind is why was it not included in the initial list? It actually, uh, because uh, it was related and it was pertaining to uh, ethnic homogenization and the, let's say, the reset settlement policy of the Muslim refugees from the Caucasus and the Balkan regions of the Union and Progress Party. Because they aim at uh, settling these Muslim refugees first and foremost in uh, you know uh, the vilayets of uh, vilayets of uh, eastern Anatolia. When uh, the, when when they first decided to evacuate empty out the eastern Anatolia, when the places when the settlement places were not adequate in order to place all these Muslim refugees which were flocking and which were also uh, you know uh, temporary settling in Istanbul. They decided to open up, they decided to make room for these people uh, in new places, in new, you know, districts and cities in Anatolia. That's why Aintap was included, the settlement, the settlement in Turkish Iskan, you know, the settlement area, settlement region for Muslim refugees. Okay, I see. Um, talk to me, if you will, uh, you talk about it in your article about the relationship of the Armenians of Aintab and their Muslim counterparts, you know, the Turks, um, the relationships before the deportations began, or actually when the deportations began in the other vilayets, do you, do you have a sense of what happened to those relations? Yeah. Actually, uh, when the deportations, Aintab Armenians, first and foremost, at that time, Aintab Armenians heard that, knew that, got to know that very well, what happened Armenians in Zeytun and in Marash, because they were just very close, you know, districts and cities to Aintab. And when, what what happened in, in either Zeytun or Marash or in uh, Adana, especially in Zeytun, reflect uh, and, you know, found its reflection in Aintab, first and foremost, for Armenians. So they heard about what were, what was happening to Zeytun Armenians, what kind of, you know, 
uh, dire condi uh, under what uh, dire conditions they were in, but they still stick to the idea that deportation plan, you know, deportation wouldn't take place in Ayantap for for them. They they actually they stick to that idea. They believe in that. But after uh, after May, after June and uh, July, and and especially the, until late July, they came to the conclusion that you know the, the same deportation plan would be inflicted upon them too. Um, you know, so the relationship sorry, yeah. in, as regards to relations among uh, between the Muslim, let's say, communities and the Armenian communities in Aintab, interestingly enough, there was a actually, relatively speaking, of course, a peaceful coexistence among these two different ethno-religious communities until late uh, until late 19th century, and especially the third quarter of 19th century, the relations among these communities, these different uh, distinctive ethno-religious communities were really good. Uh, but when the Armenians, especially, you know, increased their wealth, uh, you know, took, uh, uh, up, took the upper hand in, in economy and in commerce, and, and, they, reflect, and they, they reflect this power on, on the political grounds, and they, educationally speaking, they also, you know, establish the excellent education institutions, and they were well-established society, religious in terms of, you know, religious institutions as well. All these, you know, advancement progress, which were, you know, take, which were happening in Armenian communities vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the Muslim communities created fault lines between two societies. And these fault lines created and, you know, expressed itself in, you know, in, vi in violence, especially certain moments. One of these moments was 1895 Hamidian massacres. It took place in Ayintab in November 1895. And interestingly enough, these massacres, these violent activities and incidents took place economic center, at the economic center of Armenians in Ayintab. Uh, Umit, you know, it's a recurring theme, uh, especially in recent years. Uh, I think that uh, for many people, moving beyond recognition of the Armenian genocide, we now talk about reparations and restitution. Uh, we hear a lot about the expropriation of Armenian properties. Uh, so it wasn't only human uh, loss that the Armenian nation suffered, it was a huge amount of material uh, loss as well. Um, what, did Aintab differ from the other uh, regions uh, of Western Armenia that were uh, evacuated or deported of their sort of indigenous people? Actually, Aintab, in, in that regard, I mean, uh, according to what you have just pointed at, that Aintab is an excellent example. Excellent example. It's like a microcosm which uh, the material destruction of Armenian took place. The local particip participation, active local participation in uh, annihilation uh, and the deportation of Aintab Armenians uh, was uh, just blatant, was quite clear in, in the case of Aintab. There were uh, participations from different sections of society in Ainta, but especially provincial elites, local notables, actively participated. They tried to, you know, convince the central political authorities in order to deport the Ainta Armenians in return for having, getting the especially immobile and mobile properties of Armenians in Ainta. That's why they supported the deportation plan of the Union Progress Party. They sent, for instance, wrong reports, you know, uh, and uh, uh, and calumny reports saying that you know Armenians were attacking us, Armenians in Aintab were attacking our mosque, and etc. etc. Just for the sake of pers pers persuading the central authority to deport these people, because their main aim, their main objective was to acquire properties of Armenians after their deportation. Aintab, Aintab was a concrete example of. Uh, of the of the fact that material destruction of Armenians was the first and foremost objective, for in the eyes of local you know and provincial elites of Ainta. Umit, uh, just two final questions: um, of the Armenians that were deported, uh, forcibly deported from Aintab, um, did many survive, if any, and were they able to return back to Aintab at some point? And what about today? Are there remnants left of Armenian homes and businesses, factories, certainly churches, I would presume, as well? Uh, have you been back to Aintab, and, and what is the current situation there? Yeah, 
Thank you. But these are all excellent questions. For as regards to the first question, let me give you a, a, a few uh, for uh, population uh, figures in Aintab at that time, just right before the deportation. In 1914, especially according to Armenian sources, Armenian first first account sources and first first accounts, uh, the whole population of the uh, Armenians in Aintab was between 30, uh, 36,000 and 40,000. And this, uh, 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 especially 20,000 of these Armenians uh, were, uh, were, 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 were perished and 12,000 Armenians, Aintab Armenians, managed to, managed to survive and return, return to their hometown in Aintab. So we are talking about 10,000, 12,000 Armenians who managed to survive and who uh, who came back to their hometown. And one uh, one point which I would like to underline is that the situation of Aintab Armenians uh, in as vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you know, the Armenians in, for instance, Mush, Bitlis, Erzurum, Sivas, and all, I mean, I'm talking about the six vilayets. Uh, they, 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 Aintab Armenians were not that miserable, were not that exposed to these harsh conditions because there were two train stations in Aintab, in Aintab region. One was Akchakoyin Railroad Station, the other one was the Katma Railroad Station. Katma was located in Kilis. So Armenians, I mean, uh, so to speak, had an I mean, Armenians had an opportunity to be, you know, sent away by wagons within these train stations vis-a-vis -vis the, you know, situation of Armenians in the Eastern Milan. That's the reason why they were not, uh, they were not subject to harsh persecutions, they were not subject to, you know, attacks of chetes or irregular, you know, forces because of these vehicles, because of this convenient, which were, were uh, provided by the railroad station. That's, that's the reason why the number of persecuted people in Aintab was not that high in relation to, uh, you know, the people in Eastern Vilayet. And 12,000 Armenians managed to, you know, uh, return Aintab. But actually, in 1918, and they start to return to Aintab uh, December 1918. But besides these 12,000 Aintab Armenians, there were also other Armenians from Erzurum, from Sivas, and from Kayseri region. They also decided to return Aintab for because of security reasons, because they thought Aintab would be much more secure, you know, for their living. That's why they also moved to Aintab. So we are talking about approximately 18,000 Armenians who managed to, you know, return to Aintab? Uh, out of eighteen thousand, twelve thousand Armenians managed to, managed to uh, return to Aintab. Uh, what As happened to, to them? I mean, issue it, now, no, no. Uh, I just want to interrupt because, it, it, again, you know, one question leads to another. Were they able to stay, or were they eventually also uh, forced to leave at some point? They were able. To, uh, they were able to stay until 1921, 1922, because you know, in December 1918, first. Aintab uh, faced the British occupation. British occupation of Aintab provided uh, Aintab Armenians to, you know, to 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 uh, to return to Aintab and and to live in a secure way, uh, in a convenient way. But when the British occupation was replaced with the French occupation, and then the uh, the war started in Aintab, Aintab war started between you know French forces, including Armenians, and the and the Kemalist forces in Aintab. I am talking about the time period between October 1919 and, uh, and, and, and December 1922. December 1922, there was no Armenian in Aintab because the many of the Aintab Armenians evacuated Aintab as of, uh, as of February 1921 alongside French regiments. It's a fascinating story. And a final question that, you know, I interrupted you. <laughs> Uh, before you had a chance to answer. Well, and what about today? Issue, I didn't yeah. say anything about the property issue in Aintab. The property issue, it, it, it's extremely important because, as I said, the Aintab Armenians, especially the, the local participation Aintab Armenians, uh, the, the main stake for these local and provincial elites and even for ordinary Muslims in Aintab was uh, material and, and the, or having or, the, you know, acquiring the uh, movable and immovable properties of Armenians. The the, uh, the the richness and the wealth of uh, 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 people in Ayinta, the Muslim people I am talking about, uh, was dependent upon acquiring these properties. These people, these, these provincial elites, 
who are very well known in Aintab. These are all, you know, well known families. They acquired our main properties by, you know, supporting and giving their consent to Union and Progress Party to deport Armenians. In return for that, they got these properties. The, some of them, you know, purchased these properties in a ridiculous prices in auctions, for instance. They got these properties and they became very rich. In 18, 80s and 90s in Turkey, they became urban bourgeoisie, you know. And their origin of their wealth and their richness is uh, is, 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 is Armenian properties in Aintam. So now the many of the Armenian houses turn out to be coffee shops. You know, the Protestant churches, first they were used as, you know, manufacturers and then they turn out to be Atatürk culture centers and etc. and etc. All these properties were now, you know, have been turned out to be uh, individual properties, let's say, in Aintam. Okay, uh, Umit, and just as a final question, uh, yeah. today, as I was asking earlier, are there any existing buildings, uh, schools, factories, homes, churches that once at one time belonged to the Armenian uh, population there? For instance, I can give you a, a, a number of examples. The Jebejian houses, it was, it's, still, it's still standing over there. Karamanukyan house, uh, Perenian family's house, Sarkis Kratyan house, you know, these are all well-known and, you know, and the leading families of the Armenian community in Aintab. Their houses were are still standing, and they turn out to be, uh, you know, either coffee shops or you know, uh, individual property. Uh, some of them turn out to be the uh, boutique hotels and etc. Catholic Church of Armenians is still standing. It turns out to be Atatürk Culture Center, for instance. One of the Protestant church was owned by a uh, has been uh, owned by a private individual. For uh, the, I'm talking about the second uh, first Protestant church in the Kayacık region in Ayintap. Uh, Nazar Nazarian house, as you know, it turns out to be a coffee shop, which is called, you know, Papyrus Cafe. It's quite well known for the ales of Ainta Parmenians, and 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 so on and so forth. And the list goes on. List uh, goes on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank Thousands you. of lists. Now I am trying to make a list of these properties, location, you know, I, I am trying to pinpoint the location of these properties and try to find out who got to, who owned these properties in the first place and then who acquired from these people and that people and these people. Uh, it's an amazing and very rewarding uh, work and research that you do. Umit, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the research and thank you for joining us once again here at CivilNet. Thank you, likewise. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to remind our viewers that joining me via Skype from Worcester, Massachusetts was historian Umit Kurt of Clark University. Stay with CivilNet. <laughs>